Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 21. This is Palm Sunday. Someone said to me, they said, how are you going to fit Palm Sunday into a prophetic series? And I said, wait and see. <laughs> Did you know Palm Sunday is the, the time when the true king of the universe, the Prince of Peace, the Lord of Lords, came into Jerusalem as God the Father prophesied he would through Zechariah the prophet as the king. And he was rejected, completely rejected. By the end of the week, the people that screamed Hosannas were screaming, crucify him. So Palm Sunday is when the king of the universe, the prince of peace, enters into the center of the universe to God, the city of Jerusalem, declares himself king, and the true king is rejected. Then he spends, as we'll see this morning, the rest of the week showing the error of the religious leaders who didn't accept him, and he ends the week with his last sermon, which was, watch out. A false king of humanity is coming. I'm the true king, but when the false one comes, the whole earth will follow him. He says, I'm the true king, I'm rejected. The false king, when he comes, will be received. Now that, that message of Palm Sunday usually isn't what we really get to because we focus on the palms and the chants and the clothes that were spread and the donkey coming in and, and all of that. But actually what Jesus used this day for was to say as the real king, be sure that you are following the real king and not the false king that the whole world will follow. Matthew 21, we're gonna read it in just a moment. But as we celebrate what is traditionally called Palm Sunday, by the way, the chronology, if you look at biblical chronology, Palm Sunday really was probably Palm Monday, but it's okay, the church wanted to make it a Sunday, and that's great, it's good to have Palm Sunday that was Monday, it doesn't matter. But uh, probably from the calendar, in AD 30 and 33, the lambs were chosen on the 10th, and the 10th on both of those years was a Monday. But uh, that doesn't change the message. We commemorate the day when God sent Jesus into Jerusalem as the promised Messiah. He was the Prince of Peace. He was the only one who can govern the world in righteousness. But he was rejected as king by the people. Jesus would not give them what they wanted, so they rejected him. And so the summary of the triumphal entry week is the rejection of the real king. Now, when I say that, it's a sober note because Christ's rejection goes on even to today. When I share the gospel, when you share the gospel, when the gospel is preached and people turn from it because Jesus Christ is too hard, he demands complete allegiance. He commands repentance. That means I must change my mind about me being in control, about m me being good enough to save myself. And I must repent of that and embrace him as my only hope. And they say, oh, Jesus is too hard. The gospel of repentance and forsaking sin and walking in obedience to Christ as rule of their life is too hard. And most people, when they reject the gospel, say, I want to cling to my sins, my way, more than I want to bow and cling to Jesus. And thus they lose eternal life through him. We've already seen in Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said we can only have one king. And so the one king came on Palm Sunday and was rejected. And the one king is presented to people in this world. In fact, if you take what John says in 1 John, it appears that Jesus is presented to everyone in one way or another because it says that he is the light that lights everyone that comes into the world. One way, either through their conscience pricking them, through the awareness of creation, or through hearing the gospel preached, everyone is confronted with the reality that there is a God that they have to reach out for. But when they reject that one king, they lose all. Well, there's one king we served in Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem marks perhaps the most public ministry that Christ ever had. 
The records from the time of Christ tell us that 260,000 lambs were killed during that period of time of Passover in the 30s AD. The temple records, Josephus wrote it down, and it's still in the archives that a quarter of a million plus lambs, you say, "Uh uh-huh. Well, one lamb had to be slain for every 10 people. And so we know that the Passover in the environment, in the environs around Jerusalem hosted two and a half million people during Passover of AD 30 to 33. So think of two and a half million people around a city that normally only ran a couple hundred thousand, tenfold expansion of people. And Jesus, as you see in Matthew 21, is coming into town, and it was probably an incredible number of pilgrims that packed the area around Jerusalem that may have formed the largest crowds that ever followed Christ. In fact, an eyewitness account in John 12, 19, John records that the Pharisees said, the whole world is following him. So it it was a momentous event, the Palm Sunday triumphal entry into Jerusalem. But at that moment, they were rejecting the real king. Well, Matthew 21, we're gonna read five through 11, the Palm Sunday passage. You have it, let's stand together, and you listen to God's record of this event of the real king presenting himself at that moment in history when he was on earth. Verse five, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly, sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, All the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the freedom to read it. Thank you for your spirit, our teacher within, to help us to know your truth, understand your way, and I pray we would hear you speak today, and that we would follow the true king, and as he told us, that we would be on the alert for the false king who is being embraced around the world as the one who will come, who will not make the demands that Jesus, that you made. O Lord, how we should be not deceived especially in this dark time we live. In the precious name of Jesus, this Palm Sunday, we ask, amen. You may be seated as you're seated. It's fascinating as we study what happened as Jesus rode into Jerusalem. He rode into Jerusalem as the real king of all mankind. Uh, This is an amazing day. It's the first time that God the creator shows up as the king of the universe. And and it wasn't appropriate if tens of thousands of people were yelling and crying and praising and if they were throwing their cloaks down that Jesus came in with all those palm branches. It is a little reminiscent of what it says in Revelation because it says that, that there will be all the multitude countless around the throne waving palm branches and falling before him. So it, it, it is quite a, a similar reception for the king of the universe. But Jesus rode into Jerusalem as the real king of all mankind. And the key event of entry into Jerusalem in triumph, which is called Palm Sunday, marks the presentation. God first began through his prophets, through Moses, and on through all the prophets, all the way through the minor prophets. 
he began laying the foundation for the coming king. And the final declaration came from Zechariah chapter 9, as Zechariah said he would be the promised one. As Jesus rode into Jerusalem, just as Zechariah said he would, Jesus was the real king. Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus was the promised one. And that's how he came. And Jesus came that day as the only one who could bring real peace. Now, what the people wanted was false peace. They wanted a military overthrow. That's what was in the back of their minds. They hated the Roman occupation. And they wanted Jesus because he could feed everybody and raise the dead and heal any wound. They wanted him to lead and overthrow the Romans. And what they wanted was not real peace, they wanted their peace, their way. And so Jesus would not give them what they wanted. The nation wanted freedom from Rome, not deliverance from their sins, not a, an abasement of their pride. So the crowd chanted hosannas on Palm Sunday, but their hearts and wills said something else. It's kind of when people listen to the gospel, they say, oh, that sounds so good. Yes, forgiveness, peace, yes. Surrender, no. Uh, absolute obedience to Christ, no, no. Renouncing myself, no. Saying I'm, I'm desperately wicked, no. No, I, I don't want that. I just want the peace and the forgiveness. They just wanted the freedom, the overthrow of Rome. They didn't want Jesus Christ. Most Bible scholars believe Christ was crucified either A.D. 30 or A.D. 33. And I mean, even Dallas Seminary, even you know, all the luminaries that are, that are on the, uh, the radio, most of them you know, are between A.D. 30 or A.D. 33 because those years, the 10th of the sun was on, Friday, on Monday and the Passover fell on Friday. And that's what the, the, the major tradition coming from the first century is that Jesus was crucified on Friday and that he came in on the day that the lambs were presented. And so because of that, if Jesus arrived on Monday, he would have rode into town at the same time all the Passover pilgrims were bringing their lambs to the temple. See, there was, it, the timing was unbelievable. Uh, for Jesus to get this crowd coming while streaming in from every direction were pilgrims bringing their lambs. And Jesus to come in in the midst of all that is, is an amazing timing from God. If Jesus entered Jerusalem triumphantly on Monday, he was received into the hearts of the Jewish people as a nation, much as a family was receiving their sacrificial lamb into their home. In so doing, our Lord would have fulfilled the Passover symbolism even in this small detail. Now you say, what's the symbolism? Exodus 12, the Passover, the original one, the one we're going to be talking about Thursday night. The, the Jewish families, before the death angel came, before the final ultimate plague, they were to bring a lamb into their home on the 10th and keep the lamb with the family so that the children got endeared to this sweet little uh, beautiful creature so that when it was slain on the 14th that it would be something that would crush you know and break their hearts that this little lamb had to die to give its blood to save them from the wrath of God. That's the symbolism of the Passover that Jesus fulfilled. And so when Jesus was crucified on Friday the 14th of Nisan of the Jewish calendar, he was the true Passover lamb sacrificed for the sins of the world. Well, by the end of the week, the crowd sensed no movement to overthrow the Romans. See, they, they heralded Jesus, but they listened and watched him, and he didn't do an overthrow. So by the end of the week, they were, with their mood swiftly changed, they rejected him, culminating in his crucifixion. And that was the answer mankind gave. The real king was rejected. Not just rejected, humiliated, treated like no one else had ever been treated, and crucified. The message for us this Palm Sunday is clear. Today we remember when God presented Christ as Messiah, and when he did, Jesus, the real king, was rejected. Palm Sunday's passing allegiance is something we should think about. All the shouts, all the honor, all the praise lasted just for hours, but their hearts were not devoted. 
Their lives were not surrendered. Their spoken allegiance was all they gave, not their hearts. It was very passing allegiance. Even the disciples were puzzled. Now you understand, disciples knew the Bible pretty well, and they knew that this descendant of David would come and set up a kingdom. And that meant Israel would be the the chief of all the world under his control. And they were just itching for that to happen. And so everything Jesus did, and I just looked down in Matthew 21. I'm actually going to do a Bible survey with you. I want to show you what Palm Sunday leads to. Because if you look down in Matthew 21, 1 through 11, this is the, the first day's events narrated by Matthew. And basically, I would say this is Monday. Jesus rode into town at the head of a massive crowd. They chanted Hosanna's verses 1 through 11. And Jesus goes right into the temple. Um, in fact, if you, it, Matthew only gives one look at this. All four Gospels talk about this. Matthew gives one perspective. But if you blend what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John say, even though Matthew doesn't tell us in verse 11, Jesus continued into the city of Jerusalem. He goes in the temple, looks around, and he leaves. That's all he does. Everyone was wanting something. And so Monday, all Jesus does is ride into town, go in the temple, look around at the improper practices. They were at their height. People were buying and selling, uh, getting their lambs, and getting ready for the Passover. And Jesus returns to stay in Bethany. Now, Look at verse 12, because now it's Tuesday. Then Jesus went in the temple and drove out those who bought and sold in the temple. The cleansing of the temple was not on the same day as the triumphal entry. We know that because Mark and Luke tell us that. And so Jesus comes the next day, staying in Bethany on the other side of the Mount of Olives with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and comes back on Tuesday. So on the next morning, on the way back into Jerusalem, Jesus curses the fig tree. How do we know that? Mark eleven fourteen tells us that on the way into town, all the disciples were hungry. They probably slept too long. They didn't eat. Jesus is going back for another day of ministry. They want a fig, and they see the fig tree. Jesus goes up to it. There's no fruit on it. So all he does is verbally curse it. And, and Mark eleven twenty 20 tells us that the disciples marveled when they returned, that it had withered brown and shriveled up dead instantly like that within that day of the cursing. So Tuesday, Jesus arrives in the temple, and what it says in chapter 21, verse 12 of Matthew, and for the second time cleanses it just as he did at the start of his ministry in John 2. So Tuesday, Monday is 21, 1 through 11. Tuesday starts at verse 12 and goes down through verse 17. And Jesus threw out all the buyers and sellers who had filled the temple with merchandise instead of worship. And he said, this is supposed to be a place of prayer for all nations. People are supposed to hear about God here. And you're, you're making them change their money, you're making them buy your, your livestock, he, and he threw them out. And then he leaves. Now Wednesday, look at verse 20. This is coming back Wednesday morning. And I mean, they, it was a very big event, this cleansing of the temple, and it caused a huge ruckus, and so they scampered out, uh, the people did, and Jesus went home to Bethany. But Wednesday morning, he's coming back into town. And the disciples noticed the fig tree on the way into the temple. That's verses 20 to 23. And it was dried and shriveled. It was a picture of Judaism, dried and shriveled, so far from the truth, with the truth himself among them, and they didn't know it, they rejected him. Jesus spends the whole day teaching in the temple. In fact, this, this is amazing. If, if you look starting at verse 23, uh, the religious leaders who he had just castigated by cleansing their concession stand start pummeling Jesus. And for the first time in hundreds of years, truth was filling the temple undiluted and unrestrained. And, and from Matthew 21, 23, all the way through the end, turn over to 23, 39. All of this is Jesus systematically telling parables about how bad the religious leaders were and culminating with the, the fiercest words Jesus ever spoke. Matthew 23 is unvarnished. Jesus, with no, no kindness apparent, excoriating 
the religious leaders. And he calls them all kinds of, he says, you're like a tomb full of decaying corpses. You are, you know, you're like a, a drinking cup that's, that's pretty on the outside. When you look inside, rotten stuff's inside. I mean, it's just unvarnished criticism of their hypocrisy. And so Jesus, in his, his final public message, that's what Matthew 23 is. The last time Jesus speaks in public is Matthew 23. It's not very positive. It's, there's nothing that, that is winsome about what he said. It's total correction of evil. Well, then Jesus heads out of Jerusalem after preaching uh, that sermon. And, and look at the note he leaves in 2337. Jesus laments over Jerusalem after he's spent the whole day teaching the truth, correcting and chastising the leaders, the religious leaders. Then he laments and, and he says, um, Verse, verse 38, your house is left to you desolate. I say unto, me, unto you, you will see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He says, this is the end. And he doesn't talk anymore in public. Boom, he ends. But the day doesn't end then. Jesus heads out to the east, and that's when chapter 24 starts. Isn't this fascinating? This is Christ's last public day of teaching. Jesus has yesterday, Tuesday, cleaned the temple, Wednesday, gone in and taught truth in the temple and totally offended the religious establishment more than he ever had in his life. And now he's walking back to Bethany, and as he walks out of Jerusalem, down the Kidron, up the side of the Mount of Olives, the disciples tug on him in chapter 24. And as he departed from the temple, look at Matthew 24, 1, his disciples came to show him the buildings of the temple. See, everyone was in awe of the beauty of the temple. Uh, Josephus tells us that when the army camped around the Roman uh, legions, that when the sun would rise, that it glinted off the gold so much that it was kind of like driving into the sunrise, you know, on 94 going toward Detroit, where you just can't even see. It's just blinding you or going into the sunset, you know, if you're heading toward Chicago. It's just, that's what the temple was like. It just was so beautifully gold-covered and just glinted. So the disciples were saying, look at it, look at this, Jesus. And so on the Mount of Olives, still facing Jerusalem, before going down the backside to Bethany, Jesus stops to discuss the temple's grandeur. And what we see is, starting in verse 2 of Matthew 24, is Jesus' explanation. He's summarizing the week. I mean, it's fast coming to an end. It started with him coming as the triumphant king. He's rejected, he corrects the religious leaders, he's leaving town now, and he's warning them. And that's what we see here. And by the way, for the rest of the week, Thursday is the Last Supper, Friday he's crucified and buried, and Sunday he rises. So there's every day of the, the week. But the day that the real king explains the future is chapter 24. In the context of Palm Sunday is when Jesus explains the future. And I hope that this, this week, that's why someone said, what does this have to do with prophecy? This connects the life of Christ with the book of Revelation. Jesus said, I'm the real king. I did come. They rejected me. The false king is coming. Now, watch how he explains that. Jesus takes time to explain the future plans that God has for the world before the cross. It's amazing. He spends a whole chapter, 24 and 25, talking about his coming. Two chapters, 24 and 25, talking about his return. Amazing that he devotes so much time, but it's in conjunction with the triumphal entry rejection and the coming deceiver that's going to be uh, the central part of what Jesus teaches. Well, the last part of Wednesday of Passion Week, Jesus teaches the disciples by virtue of inspiration and us today about a false king who is coming. Now the false king, you can see him in verse 14, um, the gospel will be preached to all nations and then verse 15, when you see the abomination of desolation, that's what Jesus calls this false king. In Matthew 24, 15, he is the abomination that causes desolation. But when Jesus talks about the coming false king or, or antichrist, Jesus tells us the same message. By the way, he repeats it in Mark 11 or Mark 13, Luke 21, 
and Revelation 6 through 19. This is the same message. In fact, everything we're going to study in Revelation 6 is, is prefigured and, and shown here in, in kind of a sketch form of Matthew 24. It's amazing that the end of his teaching ministry, Jesus devotes so much time to giving his disciples a picture of history to come. Now, when we read this, I mean, I read Matthew 24 many times, and so have you. It doesn't look shocking to us. Basically, all Jesus says is, to us 2,000 years later, something that sounds quite familiar. Jesus told them that what we know is the history of the past 20 centuries since he said this, the world would have wars, famines, troubles, and persecutions for Jews and believers. And that's just what's happened. That's all Matthew 24 says, that there'll be this ongoing you know, kind of mix of wars and rumors of wars, and there'll be famines, and there'll be pestilence, and there'll be persecution of believers. And that's basically the last 2,000 years. If you just back off and look, you see those elements. Now, the long, hard scope of human history is painful. That's what Jesus was saying. He's saying, once I'm rejected as king, there's going to be this long period of painful human history. Now, the disciples waiting for Christ to march to power, remember, they thought he was bringing in the kingdom. His disciples did. That's why Judas gave up on him, because he didn't do it. So he said, I'm going to betray this guy. He didn't do what he said. He's not really the Messiah. And so the, this, the other 11 didn't see Jesus taking the throne back. They didn't see him routing the Romans. They didn't see Israel being brought into the kingdom. And now it's so troubling to hear Jesus' words, for all the things Jesus spoke about to take place meant a long time was going to pass between this time Jesus was on earth and when he came back. I mean, if you just look at at Matthew 24, starting at verse 3, if you look at that, it takes a long time for all those things to happen that he's talking about. And so as the disciples listened to Christ explain these things, and what was to come for their city, Jerusalem, and the people, the Jews, they must have been stunned. Jesus described a long, tortuous history for Jerusalem and the Jews, filled with wars, conquests, persecutions, and globally felt disasters. You notice what it says. Jesus says, look at verse 6. You will hear of wars. That's plural. It's not a war. It's wars, plural. Next, rumors. Uh, it's not a rumor. It's rumors. Jesus painted the picture of a long time. Look at verse 8. He said, this is only the beginning. It's just going to get worse and worse. Basically, Jesus, now listen to this. Jesus was a pessimist when it comes to history. Did you catch that? Look at verse 8. It's only the beginning of trouble. Jesus was not an optimist about human history. Jesus was a pessimist about human history. In other words, Jesus was not the theological group called the post-millennialist. You know who they are? They think the world's going to get better and better and better and better and better, and finally it's going to be perfect. Jesus wasn't a post-millennialist. Jesus did not tell us things were going to get better and better. Rather, he said they're going to get worse and worse. So Jesus was a pessimist about the future. Jesus said the world to come after his death, burial, and resurrection faced a barrage of false Christ. Look what it says in verse 5. Take heed, or 4. Take heed lest no one deceive you. Verse 5, because some will come and deceive many. Look at verse 11. False prophets will rise up and deceive many. Uh, Look at verse 24. False Christ, false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders and deceive. You know what Jesus said? You know what the future is going to be? A barrage. It's going to be a barrage of false Christ, false teachers, false messiahs, false prophets, interspersed with wars, rumors of wars, ethnic strife, and persecution of God's people. That's Jesus Christ's view of history. If Jesus was your history teacher, and he is, that's his view of history. By the way, just what Jesus said came true. Jesus said that they're going to come and destroy the temple, and they did in AD 70. By the way, there's a whole group of people called preterists, and it's very popular. A preterist believes that everything in Matthew 24 was fulfilled in AD 70. The problem is verse 15. When did verse 15 happen? When did the abomination that causes desolation stand in the temple declaring himself to be God? In AD 70, it didn't happen. And that's why all the tribulation events that are in the rest of the chapter also haven't happened. But 
All the disasters mankind has ever faced will roll on until the period when each type of disaster gets magnified to the point everyone on earth feels the horror. By the way, did everybody on earth feel the horror of AD 70? No. About 70% of the world didn't even know Jerusalem was destroyed, ever. I mean, I don't know if the Chinese ever got the word. I don't know if the, the people living in India ever heard that Jerusalem got destroyed. It wasn't felt. I mean, certainly uh, South America, North America, and Oceania, and, and most of Africa never heard about it. But in the tribulation, the whole world feels the events. So history taught by Jesus can be summarized this way. The period between his first coming, born in Bethlehem, all the way through the triumphal entry in the cross, and his second coming, which is yet future, will be nothing but relentless troubles that will eventually reach the point of never before seen disasters globally. Plus what Jesus said, and I showed you in verse four, five, 11, and 24, the backdrop is gonna be deception. So this morning, the, the key element of this whole talk Jesus is giving is not about how bad the disasters and how to identify which ones are the key ones. The backdrop is deception, deception, false Christ, false Christ is coming. Now, Jesus gives the only true map of the future. What you have before you, this, this is, and, and if you have a red letter Bible, all but a few words in chapter 24 are blazing red. This is Jesus giving us a map of the future. We should listen. The lesson Jesus gave them and us is what we're trying to understand as the plan of God for the future. And what Jesus is saying is don't listen to people who misrepresent God's word and try to deceive people into things God has not said. You say, are there such people? Yes. Always there have been. Some of the more famous ones were the occultic induced words of the 16th century mystic Nostradamus. I mean, now he's famous. His little writings, these occultic writings about the future have constantly been in print since the 16th century. Total misrepresentation, falsehood. Uh, even in our century, the 21st century, do you all remember? I mean, it's been a couple years, but do you remember Harold Camping? I mean, he, he told everybody exactly when Jesus is gonna return. Now, he was a misguided believer. Nostradamus is a misguided, occultic unbeliever. But Jesus said, don't listen to anybody that, that doesn't say what my word says. And Jesus said, no one will know the day or the hour. And as soon as someone tells you it's 1988 and there's 88 reasons why it's 88, or the next year, 89 reasons it's 89, be careful. Jesus said, especially beware of those who claim to be Christ. Now, most of us don't think people claim to be Christ. Yes. I mean, we've all heard of the Moonies. I mean, you ever heard of the Moonies? Did you know Sung Young Moon claims to be a Messiah, a Christ? Now, he died last year, and he's not, and he never was. But even, I mean, here in America, we had one. Do you remember in Texas, any of you old enough, in 1993, the Branch Davidian thing with David Koresh? He claimed to be Jesus Christ. It's not... It's not never happening. It's constantly happening. It's just we don't pay attention to it. But look at verse 24, because I want to show you something that many of us haven't really thought about. There's a connection, and I want to show it to you in verse 24, because this is what it says. For false Christ and false prophets will rise and, great signs, and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So there's going to be a teaching from and about a false Christ that is going to be so strong that even true believers might start believing it. Now before we go today, I'm gonna to share something maybe you've never thought of. The connection between modern day Islam and the events of the tribulation. Now let me give you a little, I spent this whole week, maybe it's why I lost my voice, I spent the whole week studying Islamic theology. Bonnie kept coming in saying, aren't you supposed to be reading the Bible, honey? I said, I am, I am. But I says, I'm looking at how it's, it's so falsely twisted in Islam. Let me just give you a thumbnail. The Muslims already believe in Jesus, by the way. You know that, don't you? The Muslims believe in Jesus. I mean, he is a prophet. Do you know where the, the Muslim theology says Jesus is right now? At the right hand of Allah in heaven. He didn't even die. He was taken up like Elijah, up to the right hand of Allah in heaven. Jesus is standing there, waiting to return. 
I mean, it's so, so unbelievable for us to realize what 1.2 billion people believe that's exactly opposite what God's word says. But let me give you uh, a warning. Uh, one well-known professor from the East Coast, he's a representative of the Christian left, his name is Tony Campolo, he wrote this recently. Watch out for him. This is what he said. When we listen to the Muslim mystics, they talk about Jesus and their love for Jesus. And I must say, it's closer to the New Testament Christianity than a lot of Christians. Muslim mystics, description of Jesus is closer to New Testament Christianity than most Christians, Muslim views of Jesus. What is the Muslim view of Jesus? Well, with Campolo so popular in the new online community of undiscerning, ungrounded so-called evangelicals, we need to ask, is the Muslim Jesus the same as the biblical Jesus? Because you're gonna hear this more and more. There are a lot of people saying, they're pre-evangelized, they already believe in Jesus. No, they're the opposite. They're inoculated against the truth with their Jesus they've been taught. The best way to know what they believe is to look at Islamic theology. Islam has a well-defined doctrine about the future and amazingly includes a return to earth by Jesus. So, what are the false teachings of Islamic theology? And, and this is so forefront to where we live in the world. I mean, Islam is all around us and it's on the news and it's shaping world events. If I could give you a synopsis of Islamic theology as it relates to the end times, it would be made up of two parts. In other words, if you want to know Islamic theology, you have to have two parts. It's kind of like Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism has the Bible and tradition. Uh, Judaism had the Old Testament and rabbinic tradition. Islams have the very divine words of God, the Quran. And then they have tradition, which they call the Sunnah, which is made up of the practices and sayings of, of Muhammad, the Hadith, and then the surah, which are you know, his biographical, what he did. And so his actions and his words. And, and those two parts are the traditions, and then there's the divine word. So, so Islam is very much like Judaism and Roman Catholicism. We, however, stick with only the divine word. And Paul said, don't follow uh, traditions that aren't from the word. And Jesus said, don't follow traditions of man follow the word so from islamic theology jesus is a man not god that is i mean a five-year-old can see that if they read islamic theology just i mean it's kind of like storybook level jesus is a man not god he did not die he was taken to heaven like elijah just that point alone makes islamic theology dangerously false if christ didn't die then he didn't rise. He couldn't have offered a substitutionary sacrifice for the sin of the world. And if Jesus is a man and a prophet, then the Jesus of Islam is right now at the right hand of Allah, awaiting a return to come to earth at Allah's command. By the way, why is Allah going to send him back? That's in Islamic theology too. Allah sends him back and in Islamic theology, Jesus returns to explain to misguided Christians that he is not God's son, that he did not die, and he did not rise again. And when he returns in Islamic theology, he lives on earth and gets married and finally dies and is buried as a good prophet. So Islamic theology has a completely different Jesus. When they say he is a good prophet, he is a good man, not God. He did not die for sin. He did not get buried and he did not rise. He never died and he went like Elijah up to heaven and he's with Allah. When a person says they believe in Jesus, we must find out what Jesus they're talking about. The Islamic Jesus is not the Lord Jesus Christ. He is not the son of God. He is not the second person of the divine trinity, but it doesn't stop there. He's coming back. So let's talk about the coming of the false Christ. Uh, and that's why we're here today. We're listening to Jesus teach after his triumphal entry. Look at Matthew 24, 15. This is so relevant because there are a billion, 200 million people that believe some form of what I'm telling you. Now, I know that there's the, the Shia and the Sunni, and they have differing views. In fact, especially of eschatology, they each think the other one is the, is the bad guy, uh, the two branches of Islam. But... Um, 
Jesus is talking about a false king that deceives the whole earth. That's what Matthew 24, 15 says. This, this abomination that, calls, uh, that causes desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. When you see him stand in the holy place, Jesus said, I hope you understand. Now, turn from Matthew 24 to Revelation 13. This is the tie. And before we go, I want to finish this off for you in your mind, okay? The abomination that causes desolation is the Antichrist. Revelation 13 is where we meet this Superman. The whole world has always been, and look at our movies. I mean, we have more and more. They're bringing into movie form the comic books I used to read 50 years ago. And, and the whole world is now watching and enjoying as entertainment, but subtly and, and back, actually in the back of their minds, everyone is saying, I wish we could have a Superman come and say, and end all this warfare and everything. Well, let me tell you, he's coming. And Revelation 13 is when we meet the Superman. And this is what Revelation 13 is all about. As the end of the world approaches, earth's darkest hour comes. Hell will soon open, the pit will vomit out its demon hordes that will run violently throughout, destroying humanity. Beasts from the abyss will wreak havoc. Satan himself will invade the earth and seemingly conquer it at last. That's what's ahead. How does it happen? At the helm, Revelation 13 says, is the visible leader of the world, the long-promised man of sin, the lawless one, the beast, the coming world leader, commonly known as the Antichrist. But behind this man is the real power, the god of this world, the dragon, old Lucifer, the lying serpent of Eden, finally captivates the world through a man, the false king, empowered by Satan, that the whole world begins to follow and worship. Imagine what it would be like if that perfect leader were to step forward tomorrow. A man who seemingly appears to come out of nowhere, almost a person from the past, who rolls into one all the great leaders of the world. Imagine one man with the strength of the Caesars, with the military genius of an Alexander, with the mesmerizing oratory of Hitler, and with the warmth of a Bill Clinton who can even make his enemies smile and laugh at him. Imagine a person like that with the ruthless determination of a Genghis Khan, but with the apparent compassion and tenderness of Jesus Christ himself. And that, that's who the Antichrist is. He's the quintessential Satan's Superman. Everything the world looked for, all in one. Well, Revelation 13 explains what I consider to be the saddest doctrine of the Bible, the teaching of the Antichrist, which tells us that the false Christ will be universally embraced. On Palm Sunday week, the true Christ was rejected. Revelation 13, the false Christ is universally accepted. Well, Islam gives us an amazing distortion of truth. I want to give you a summary of Islamic eschatology. By the way, Islam the end times has three signs. All of them are, are men, people that come forward. I'll just tell you about one. And the reason is, he's in the news. I mean, this president of Iran guy, every time he comes to the United Nations, he always opens with a prayer to Almighty God and asking for him to send the Savior of the world. Basically, this is uh, Ahmadinejad's prayer. God Almighty has promised to us a man of kindness, a man who loves people, who loves absolute justice, a man who is perfectly a human being, and his name is Imam al-Mahdi. I mean, they already have given him a name. He is the enlightened one that will bring in the, the ultimate savior. He will mark a new beginning, a rebirth, and a resurrection, and it's the beginning of peace and security and genuine life. By the way, how does this guy come to earth? When they conquered 10 years ago, um, it, the, the Iraq war, when they conquered Baghdad and got into Saddam Hussein's palace, do you know what 50 foot high murals had on the walls? They had the Mahdi coming in on a white horse from heaven. What does Revelation 6 say that the, that the Antichrist rides in on? A white horse he rides into earth. See, Islamic theology talks about this one who rides on a white horse. By the way, when he arrives, he finds hidden scriptures of all places, Islamic theology says, in Galilee, in Israel. He finds hidden scriptures. 
that the Christians and Jews didn't know about, and it gets them all realizing he's the right one. Well, if I gave you a summary of the Muslim Mahdi, he's just like Revelation 13. This, this Islamic future one coming is a messianic figure. He's a descendant of Muhammad. He's an unparalleled, unequaled leader. He will come out of a crisis. He will destroy everyone who resists him. And if that sounds familiar, it's a precise description of the biblical antichrist. So in other words, Step by step, the Bible's Antichrist is Muslim, the Muslim Messiah. We know the rider on the white horse in Revelation 6 is the Antichrist. They used that verse in our Bible to describe their Mahdi, their Savior. Why am I giving you all this? Because the description of their Mahdi is exactly the description of the Antichrist in Revelation 13. In other words, the Bible's Antichrist is Islam's savior and world conqueror who establishes an Islamic kingdom. That's what Jesus was talking about. Not that this Islamic guy is going to come, but Satan's Antichrist is. And he is going to win the world. So what's Palm Sunday about? Simple. Make sure you're believing and following the real king. He has a hard message. It's pessimistic. He said, the world you live in is going to get worse and worse, but I can give you a new heart and a new spirit. Make sure that your allegiance is not passing, but that you have embraced him as your only hope. Let's stand for a word of prayer before we go. As we stand at every service, it's in the bulletin. I've said it a hundred times, but at the end of this service and every public service we have here at Calvary, there are spiritual leaders that are present at the front, men and women, who would love to open the word of God to you. Make sure that you've embraced the real Christ. He's, he is embraced by falling before him as the only hope we have to save us from our sins. We don't have half of the goodness and he gives us the rest. We are hopelessly lost and we fall before him as the only one who can take away our sins, which are enough to consign us to hell forever. If you've never fallen before him and received his forgiveness, Palm Sunday would be a great day to meet the real king. Let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you for this day. We mourn that the real king was rejected, but we have received him and have life eternal. But we know this world is going to embrace the false king. And how I pray that we would do what you left us to do, that we would believe and proclaim him whom to know is life eternal. I pray that you would draw to yourself any this morning who feel the convicting work of your spirit breathing across their lives seeking to draw them to salvation. May they say yes and bow to Christ today. And may we know your word and not be deceived. In the precious name we pray of the Lord Jesus and all God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.